So I got it in my head to build something, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. Call me old fashioned, behind the times, stubborn, stuck in a rut, whatever you'd like. But as with most things I build, I like to use parts and I'm going to need some parts to build my thing. This video will be about some of those parts. I'm going to need some gears, not these gears. These are just gears I had laying around that I hoped I could make work, but I can't. I don't really have them in the right sizes. These, frankly, are just props, so you're not sitting there staring at me holding a pencil or calipers or something machinist-y. As with most things that use gears, the size and number of gears in large part dictate what that thing will look like, how big it is, where other parts will go, etc. In a way, one could say the gears drive the design. <clears throat> Roughly, I know what gears I want for this thing that I'll be building. And seeing that it's the future and all, I was simply going to order them. But two things stopped me from doing that. First, I'm a big fan of immediate gratification. I want the gears right now. And second, I realized I already have the gears that I need. They're just trapped inside this piece of cold rolled steel. Help, get us out Help. of here. Por favor, suscríbete. Can you hear that? In the famous words of Michelangelo, we need only break enough end mills to set them free. So here it is in the CNC router. I'd like to draw your attention to that hole that wasn't there a moment ago. The purpose of that hole will become apparent when this thing starts milling, but I found for my router, specifically in steel, it doesn't like plunging end mills, especially not small ones. Since this is a high-speed spindle, I need to use small end mills, and small end mills like to break at the slightest of excuses. When I can't come in from outside the stock, sort of tangentially, I've taken to drilling these entry holes. And that one there is located between two of the gears in this case. The center of that hole, consequently, is also the origin of my G-code. Anyway, cue the music. Now, what you're seeing here isn't exactly conventional. In fact, it might just be illegal, and probably immoral. These gears, I mean, aren't conventional gears. The drill is cutting out material that will become the root of each tooth. This saves me the headache of using an even smaller end mill to get in there to create a proper gear tooth profile. This would be unacceptable for real gears, but for what I'm making, should be just fine. Which takes us to the milling. This is a 532nd two flute carbide end mill doing 9,000 RPM, and if I'm not mistaken, about 8 inches per minute. Step down is 60,000. The 532nd mill gets just shy of the root. It's too big to get into the bottom and fully form these teeth. Not counting the drilling operation, I'm doing this with two toolpaths. The first one is doing multiple depths and is leaving 10 thou material on both gears. Each gear has tabs to sort of hold it in space. The larger gear has four and the smaller has three. The second toolpath is a finishing operation at full depth using the same end mill. I made three gears in total, two 20 tooth and one 10 tooth. These are spur gears, pretty vanilla really, and they started life off in CAD with your standard involute tooth form. I mess with the form a bit to make milling on a router easier for me. You can probably tell just by looking at them that they're, well, special. Nonetheless, these are eight pitch gears. That's the size effectively. And they're 23 degree pressure angle. None of that really matters for what I'm doing. And the pressure angle is a bit of a strange one. Usually you'd see, say, 14 and a half degree or 20 degrees. The larger pressure angle gives me more space at the bottom, at the root of the tooth, which was my main concern because of what I mentioned earlier at the router, not wanting to route steel with needle-like end mills. Consequently, larger angles also lead to stronger teeth, so more load carrying capacity, which is good in my case, but the operation of the gear set won't be as smooth and they'll have a little bit more backlash, or lots of lost motion between meshing gears, which again, for this particular application, are trade-offs I was willing to make. So all I did was really wire brush these. Right off the machine, they feel, I don't know, relatively decent. I'm going to give them a couple of licks with a file right where the 2D 
milling toolpath hit the drilled hole. I don't know if you could tell, but there's a little bit of a sharp. The teeth look a bit like arrowheads. I did have a bit of a hiccup with one of these. I had a bad start with the G-code. I forgot to re-zero my origin for the single gear, and it managed to drill a hole before I could stop it. I re-zeroed and started it again, thinking what are the odds that that drilled hole is going to hit one of my teeth. And by the looks of it, I should start playing the lotto a little more often. That managed to get pretty deep before I could stop it, but it didn't break through to the other side. Now this larger spur gear took about 25-30 minutes start to finish. So instead of cutting another one, I think I'm just going to fill that in with some TIG weld and file the tooth back to form. Well, when it comes to CNC routing, I suppose the old adage is true. You take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of... Being wholly impartial, I think it's safe for me to say that these are some of the best looking gears I've ever seen. Next up, I've got some honey bunches of bushings to make. This is bearing bronze. Let's head over to the lathe. I've got half a dozen of these to make. That'd be 0.5 dozen for the metric crowd. And then one odd ball bushing, which we'll talk about once I've made it. So I'm going to truck through these pretty fast without much fanfare. They're quite simple, really. The only point of note, perhaps, is that I'll be running the lathe backwards. Well, not backwards, but spinning away from me. For that to work, since I'm still cutting on my side of the stock, I've flipped the tool upside down. See, bronze and brass have a nasty habit of throwing very fine splintery chips all over the place. Turning my cutting tool upside down and running the lathe backwards hopefully shoots all those chips down into the chip tray, and with any luck, not straight into my eyes. Here are six regular bushings. I suppose these technically be called flanged bushings, maybe thrust bushings. I don't know, but six conventional. And the seventh is the oddball I think I mentioned earlier. We'll have a better look at why this looks the way it does when I put these parts together. But for now, suffice it to say that when you see parts like this, unusual, unconventional parts, nine times out of 10, it's a sign of a lazy design. Whoever engineered this momentarily fell asleep at the wheel. Lucky for me, they don't ticket hobby machinists for weaving.
So seven bushings and three gears. I was going to end this video here, but seeing as I knocked these out in less than 10 minutes, let's keep going just a little bit further. To mount all of these parts, I'm going to need three short I'm doing this in a collet chuck to help maintain the concentricity between the two ends of the stub shafts, basically because I have to flip the part. Frankly, for what I'm doing, it's not that big of a deal. The tolerances I would have gotten out of my three jaw would have probably been fine, but force a habit, I guess. So this shaft you just saw me make will be the high-speed drive. It can be driven from both ends, and it takes the smallest gear. Now, the larger gears are keyed because, frankly, I have room for a key. This one doesn't. A keyway in this would have cut the gear in two pieces. So my plan is to braze this on. Now, ideally, this would be made as one solid part. The gear is part of the shaft. I wasn't able to do that because I don't have gear cutters. And because of where this will be sitting on the shaft, sort of the depth from one end, I wouldn't have been able to cut it on the CNC router the way I did just sort of a 2D profile. It would have just been too long of a reach for those small end mills. So let me break the torch out and we'll glue these two together. Would you believe I just spent 30 minutes turning my garage upside down looking for a brazing rod? I know I have it because not two weeks ago, I don't think, I came across it on a shelf, thought to myself, I'd better wrap these up and put them in a dry place before all the flux starts to crack off. They were the silver-based ones, too. Given what those things cost, that's like losing track of a $100 bill. All right, well, I think that does it for this video. Not too much happened, but maybe you liked something in there. Again, this shaves some time off the official build video, which hopefully should be out soon. I hope you're all doing good, and as always, thanks for watching.